Okay, Kate, we can start. We want to start and keep on time. Well, I just want to say welcome, everyone. Another great turnout, and I know we'll have others coming in a little later. Uh, I'm Larry Ricketts, and I, for the lawyers in the group and others, I'll let you know we're recording this session. We're gathering to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the oldest alumni, college alumni association in the world. Uh, it's simply amazing that that is the truth. We're also celebrating uh, and hope to celebrate together our 55th next year. And I can tell you, to me, I don't know about you guys, that is also absolutely amazing. And we're also gathering um, so that we can share stories of our classmates and hear some of their expertise. So on this Earth Day, we're gonna hear from our classmate, John Cannon, who was motivated by the first Earth Day in 1970 to enter the field of environmental law. And from the Williams Alumni Magazine, I can say John echoes truly do rebound. Um, before I introduce John, there's a few housekeeping details. Uh, first of all, I hope you all know where your refrigerator is and your laboratories are, because I can't tell you where they are in your houses, so I won't. Um, however, you should know that you're all going to be muted during John's presentation, and we ask you not to chat or comment during the time he's presenting. It's sort of bothersome. We'll have plenty of time afterwards. When we come back from breakouts, you'll be free to ask questions and unmute. However, please keep muted and use the raised hand function of Zoom. When called upon to ask a question or make a comment, you may unmute at that time. For those of you that have not used the raised hand function of Zoom, you'll find it by clicking on the participants button on the tab if you're on a computer at the bottom of your screen. Some of you may have it on the reaction tab. Um, if you're using an iPod, iPad or iPhone, you'll find it under the three dot more section on the screen. Of course, you can always use the chat function when we come back for questions after the breakouts. So John Cannon went to law school at the University of Pennsylvania. Beginning in 1976, John had a number of positions at the Environmental Protection Agency. He ended up as general counsel for the EPA, and during that time wrote an opinion that backstopped the famous Supreme Court decision in Massachusetts versus the EPA. That decision opened the door to climate change regulation under the Clean Air Act. John is presently the Blaine T. Phillips Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law at the University of Virginia Law School. John gets enough accolades in the environmental law field and in academia, so my introduction at his request has been a bit informal. To me, the important aspects of John, John Cannon are his love of nature, family, running, biking, and kayaking. In addition, John is a writer, and in his retirement coming in May, just next month, I look forward to him sending me some of his poetry. Another humble Renaissance classmate, John will speak to us on Ken Law, Keep Up With Climate Change. So Professor Cannon, you're on. Don't forget to unmute yourself, John. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Larry. Now I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this won't take long. Okay, looks good. Can everybody see it? Everybody good? Okay. Uh, so uh, thanks very much for, for inviting me to this. Um, it's really gratifying to have the chance to talk to people I've known for a long time and spent important years together with about something that uh, is important to me now. And I've spent a fair amount of my recent years uh, talking about and, and teaching. And that's climate change. I think it's great to have the opportunity to do this on Earth Day, the 51st 
Earth Day, I'm wearing green um, in commemoration. So in addition to all the other um, land, uh, landmarks that, that Larry mentioned, we have, we have a day honoring the Earth. And um, I hope that stays fresh in people's minds and maybe even gets stronger as we go. So the title that I picked was Can Law Keep Up With Climate Change? But that's really not the right title. It should be Can Law Get Ahead of Climate Change? Because right now, greenhouse gas emissions are increasing, not falling. Um, they need to be leveling out and declining in order to achieve climate stability at levels that avoid dangerous impacts. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the phenomenon of anthropogenic climate change. I'm not a scientist. I'm sure there are folks uh, among you who know more uh, about the science than I do, but we need to have a common understanding of the science to understand what the challenges are from a legal and a policy standpoint, because the structure of the climate change problem is really uh, um, crucial to coming up with effective uh, legal and policy solutions. So three factors control the climate, probably more than that, but I'm gonna focus on three. The energy coming from the sun comes to the earth. It, it is either reflected by uh, light services like ice, and sent back into space and therefore doesn't, isn't absorbed by the earth or it's absorbed by the earth and then re-radiated re re as infrared radiation into the, into the atmosphere. Now, some of that energy that's re-radiated goes into space, but some of it is trapped by the atmosphere. And the components of the atmosphere that perform that function are greenhouse gases, which serve to, uh, as, a, as an opaque shield, if you will, to this radiation and sends that radiation back to Earth so it doesn't escape into space. The higher the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, the more pronounced is that effect. And therefore, the higher, a higher, the, higher the percentage of heat that goes back and is reabsorbed in the earth. So the, the, the linchpin of anthropogenic climate change is that atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases are increasing due to human activity, right? And this is, uh, I hope this is as complicated as, as um, this gets because this is about the limits of my um, numerical skills, but this is a balance or a good budget, a carbon budget for the year 2015, just to pick a recent year, that shows, um, that shows how this increase is happening. So to the left, try to get my pointer here. These left two columns are sources of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels primarily, and then an additional uh, uh, quantum from land use change, particularly deforestation, which takes the carbon that's stored in the forests and makes that available. So if you add those up, that's roughly 11.2 gigatons of carbon on that side. On the other side, that is what happens to, to these emissions. Some are taken up by the ocean, some are taken by, up by the land and therefore don't reach the atmosphere. That's about five gigatons. But the rest goes into the atmosphere as representing an additional increment of greenhouse gases attributable to human activity. And that happens on a yearly basis. And it's been happening more or less since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So now we are, our greenhouse, our concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere are about uh, 417 parts per million. Before the uh, Industrial Revolution, there were about 280 parts per million. So about a 50% increase. And as I, as I emphasize, that 
increase is continuing, right? And what, what that means is as atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases rise, more energy is entering the earth than is leaving. That increases the earth's internal energy and warming occurs. And that warming will occur until there is no net increase in carbon going into the atmosphere so that the energy going out comes to equal the energy going in and you get stability at some level. It may be a much higher surface temperature than we have now, um, but at some level, assuming no net emissions of carbon due to human activity, um, we will have a stable atmosphere and eventually a stable climate, right? So that's the physical structure of the problem. Why is that important? Because it dictates the kind of problem that, that this is. Um, and this is the kind of problem that um, generally referred to in policy circles as a tragedy of the commons. This is a tragedy of the global commons. Um, and, it, and this is, you know, the narrative goes like this. A ton of carbon dioxide emitted in Charlottesville, where I am, has the same effect on climate as a ton of carbon emitted in Shanghai, say. And that's because carbon that's emitted anywhere on Earth mixes well with other uh, carbon dioxide and creates a uniform level of or concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But, so, so, so that means that the benefits of reductions, if I reduce a, 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 a ton of carbon emitted in, in Charlottesville, the benefits of that reduction are dispersed globally, right? But if I reduce a ton of carbon in Charlottesville, I'm gonna incur all the costs of reducing that ton of greenhouse gas emissions. I have to buy a more expensive electric car or I do something else, but I incur the cost. So the individual in the case I've given or a nation, if you sort of generalize this to the national level, uh, will in, incur higher costs to reduce carbon emissions than they will experience benefits. And that means there are limited incentives for parties, individuals or nations to take action unless they're assured that everybody else on the globe or most everybody else on the globe that's emitting carbon will also reduce emissions. And of course, if they're assured that everybody else is gonna reduce their emissions, then they might be tempted to free ride since if they don't reduce emissions, it's probably not gonna change the result much. So you have this, um, this strange collective action problem, not so strange, fairly common collective action problem where the rational result would be for everybody to reduce emissions but based on individual calculations, cost benefit calculations, individuals or single nations don't have the incentives to do that. So that's the basic problem. And then it's complicated in the case of climate change by a bunch of factors, which I'll just rehearse briefly here. Um, these are features that make the collective action problem even more serious in the case of climate change. There are billions of sources all over the globe, right? And as I say, each of those sources can, can contribute to the global problem. Um, sorry. There, the greenhouse gases that go into the atmosphere have a long hang time. Carbon is up there for 100 years or more. 
And what that means is that the effect of my emissions of a ton of carbon, for example, is, is experienced not only during my lifetime, but in the lifetime of people to come. Conditions of climate stability, net zero emissions, as I said before, impose a, a significant constraint. There is scientific uncertainty, not so much in terms of the basic model of climate change that I've presented, but in terms of how quickly climate change is gonna progress in the future, how, how much more we will emit in the way of greenhouse gases, and um, how, how the temperature of the earth will respond to those emissions. And then there's a problem of unequal contributions and impacts. The United States and other large developed countries have contributed histor historically to the current levels of greenhouse gas, gases in the atmosphere and continue to contribute large uh, quantities. Smaller nations, less developed nations have contributed much less. And they may also be more vulnerable to the effects of climate change. A good example is the Maldives, right? They've contributed almost nothing to the current uh, situation that's driving global warming. But because of their status as an island nation, they face immense consequences as a result. The policy implications, the complications flowing from these features, billions of sources mean di dispersed causation, which means a very hard time to coordinate the reductions of all these sources. Long hang time means intergenerational effects. Not only are we externalizing costs on other people when we emit carbon, but we're externalizing costs on people that aren't even living, our grandchildren, to be specific. Conditions of climate stability create a problem because they mean nothing less than the transformation of the, of the current energy system, which represents a huge investment, um, very difficult to turn or transform in a short period of time. Scientific uncertainty leads to debatable goals. How much, how soon should we reduce? Um, and then these inequalities and in contributions and impacts produce a lot of debates about who's responsible, who should pay, who should act. And those carry into the policy debates and the, and the legal uh, solutions. So we have a, a, a recognizable problem, collective action problem. Law's job, one of the law's jobs is to coordinate collective responses to solve those problems. But the, the structure and these features of climate change make that challenge particularly um, daunting. So, we might hope for an international law, a law at the international level to address this problem. It's a global problem, right? It's global in scope. The, the nations are mutually responsible and therefore you would hope that they would undertake a mutual solution. At the global level, because there's no global legis legislature, there's no global police force, that solution has to be through negotiation, through voluntary agreement to some sort of treaty or other um, uh, agreement that would begin to have effect on individual nations behavior. We have such a thing, or at least we have the beginnings of such a thing in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change which begins to outline, and this is really what it does, begins to outline the terms on which the global community, the international community might begin to address this problem. It says, for example, that the goal of the international community is to prevent dangerous interference with the climate system. And the obligation of each nation is to prevent or minimize the causes of global warming. And it also announces this principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, which tries to capture 
this equity problem that I talked about before. But the but the but this agreement is a framework agreement. It doesn't tell you what is a dangerous interference with the climate system. It doesn't tell you what each nation must do to prevent or minimize, or even how the nations would go about figuring out what they should do. And it doesn't it doesn't specify what the common but differentiated responsibilities should be. So what's necessary then is some next step that implements this framework and begins to uh, put a gloss on it that uh, creates some uh, constraints, some real operative constraints on the parties. Um, and that's what, that's what the world community or some parts of the world community attempted to do in the Kyoto Protocol, which was negotiated in 1995 and included quantified emissions reductions for developed countries. And those were in the form of reductions, percent reductions in greenhouse gas emissions below a certain um, baseline. Um, but a, an important feature of this document is that there were no reduction targets for developing countries. This was thought to implement the common but differentiated responsibilities uh, principle. Uh, but that becomes a problem for reasons that I'll talk about in just a minute. The United States never became a party. So even for some developed countries, turns out for most developed countries, this agreement didn't represent a, a binding uh, solution. The, the protocol was never submitted to the US Senate for ratification because the Senate said in advance by an almost unanimous vote, it wouldn't ratify it. And in fact, it was repudiated, repudiated during the Bush administration in uh, 2001, and then later abandoned by other developed countries. So it was clear, clear from, from uh, the, the, the response and the uh, effectiveness of that document that something else had to be done. And that something else had to include some engagement with developing countries to have them undertake emissions reductions also. And you can see why that's true. And this is, as of 2018, more than half of the global emissions, CO2 emissions, were from developing countries. That is countries that weren't assigned uh, uh, limitations under the Kyoto Protocol. And those are the emissions that have been growing in recent years. You can see this, China, China's emissions have grown uh, hugely. It is now the, the, it has taken over from the United States as the leading emitter of greenhouse gases, but India is up there too, other developing nations. So it became clear that whatever the agreement was, whatever the arrangement was, it couldn't leave uh, developing countries out of it. So heading into the Paris Agreement, Todd Stern, who is the, uh, lead US negotiator, also a lawyer, um, set forth three principles that had to be implemented. One, we had to replace the top-down approach. That is the specified quantitative reductions that were set forth in the Kyoto Protocol. Why did we have to replace them? Because countries wouldn't sign an agreement that had them. The United States would not sign an agreement that had them. So that was just a matter of pragmatic um, judgment. The second thing was to shift the paradigm of differentiation. That is to include the uh, developing countries in whatever arrangement was developed. And then his third principle was build a long-term. That's have an agreement that kept going on and didn't have a decisive date for ending so that, you, so that nations would get used to this process as one of continual improvement until we could meet uh, our goals. And that, uh, those principles are embedded now in the Paris Agreement, which for the first time in, in one of these international agreements states a global goal 
of no greater than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels worldwide. That is, our goal is to keep increases in, in temperature, in the Earth's surface temperature, below two degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. Uh, actually, there's an aspirational goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius, but people are uh, skeptical that we have a, a realistic chance of, of doing that. So how? Well, so what is the structure of this agreement? How does it work? Well, it works through a, a, a system of promise and review. There are no legal enfor legally enforceable requirements in this, it's in this agreement as we would understand them. It's based on uh, voluntary undertakings by each country, which are transparently submitted, and then a systematic process for monitoring and reporting on what the countries actually accomplish, right? And in this case, the, the voluntary undertakings by the country are called uh, nationally determined contributions. Um, they are prepared by each country, submitted to the conference of the, of the agreement and updated every five years with the expectation, although it's not a legal requirement, that each update will represent increased ambition, right? Todd Stern's idea is that by making this system transparent and having these plans reported and the results reported, there will be a system of increased ambition that rising norms and expectations will drive the global community toward ever more stringent um, action in order to achieve this overall goal. There's also this global stock take, which uh, which occurs, which is uh, basically a global review of how we're doing, and that's supposed to feed back into the nation's uh, determinations of their uh, contributions. How are we doing? Well, we're not there yet. So this, so this is a complicated graph, but basically it represents projected increases in global temperatures through 2100, the end of this century, based on various scenarios. Current policies would put us at about three degrees Celsius or more above pre-industrial levels. Increases that most scientists think would, would begin to have catastrophic uh, results. Pledges and targets that have developed in response to the Paris Agreement would get us down to about 2.6 degrees Celsius, assuming those targets were actually met, right? And then you see, uh, in order to achieve two degrees Celsius, um, we, need, we need a lower trajectory. That is, we need a more stringent set of reductions. Whether we can get there or not, whether ambition increase, increases over time, then really depends on the actions of individual countries making their submissions. And this, this is what leads uh, people to say that climate change under the system is a multi-level game. There's a, there's a game going on at the international level, and then there are multiple games going on within each domestic setting, right? Biden is trying to get the United States together to, to make a more ambitious nationally determined contribution. And that process is going on all over. And there's also discussion between and among countries between the United States and China, for example, trying to encourage each other to move the process. Um, so for the United States, what are the legal instruments that exist or might exist uh, to bring us to a point of being a, 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 a reliable and constructive contributor to this international effort. The economists argue that what we need is a price on carbon. That is some set amount that would be charged to the emitter for each ton of carbon emitted to the atmosphere. And that could be done either through a carbon tax 
or through a cap and trade system where there would be a total cap on emissions and emissions allowances would be traded, able to be traded among emitters and produce effectively a market price for carbon. We had a shot at such a thing uh, in the first Obama administration. The Waxman-Markey bill was a cap and trade bill, bill which covered uh, most of the large stationary sources in the country. It had a, it had a pretty stringent goal of 83% reduction by 2050 and a provision for emission allowance trading, which made it uh, meet the economist criterion of efficiency. It passed the House of Representatives, but it didn't pass the Senate. So we don't have a price on carbon. We don't have a comprehensive piece of climate change legislation. Uh, I think the estimates of the likelihood of that happening in the current political cli climate um, are pretty slim. So we're left with a kind of a grab bag of existing statutes and other legal avenues that, um, that are the tools available to any administration that wants to move quickly on this or effectively on this. The Clean Air Act is the main tool. Larry mentioned Massachusetts v. EPA, which is a case decided by the Supreme Court, which said, which held that greenhouse gas emissions were among the air pollutants that EPA could regulate under this statute, which was enacted way back in 1970. And it also said that in making, uh, in making the determination whether to regulate, the agency was, was required to consider whether these emissions, these greenhouse gas emissions would endanger human health and welfare, and in so doing it had to rely on the science. That came down in the George W. Bush administration. The Bush administration didn't do anything with it. But when Obama came in, uh, his administration took the Clean Air Act seriously and attempted to apply this holding and regulate a number of the key sectors responsible for greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. Here are those sectors. We see in the United States by sector, greenhouse gas emissions are attributable primarily to the electric utility sector, fossil fuel plants, coal plants, natural gas plants, 30%. Transportation, 26%. Your car, my car, heavy duty trucks, and then assorted industrial uh, 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 sources make up another 21%. But you see, if you could get electricity and transportation, you would get at more than half of the emissions in the United States. And that's where the Obama administration focused its efforts under the Clean Air Act and came up with, uh, just ignore the Trump rule here for a minute and we'll focus on the good news. Um, the, it, it produced a, a car rule or a set of car rules that reduced vehicle emissions of greenhouse gases by 5% a year from, to, from 2021 to 2016 or from 2012 to 2016. It produced a rule for electric fossil fuel fired electric generating units that required a 32% reduction by 2030. And it also set standards for some other industrial operations, including oil and gas operations uh, that produce methane. Methane is a less plentiful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, but it's very powerful. So these were important, um, important. Uh, I'm trying, I'm getting my chat. Uh, so how much time do I have, Kate? Five minutes. Oh God. Okay, so. So what happened? I mean, you all know what happened. Trump gets elected and systematically rolls back these rules that were adopted in the Obama administration. So the car rules, instead of 5% a year or 1.5% a year reduction. And it's not clear that even that the automobile industry was, was in support of that. 
from 32% in the electric utility industry down to 0.5%, maybe. It's not clear that there would be any significant reduction. And the methane standards were rescinded. New president, he's trying to put back uh, 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 the broken China with various new proposals. But what this political cycling has meant is that there is no stable national policy. We've, we withdrew from Paris. Biden's trying to put together a new plan, trying to regain credibility on the international stage. But what happens when the, when the next administration comes in? And in the absence of any comprehensive climate change legislation, there really isn't a, there isn't a platform to build and sustain the kind of national uh, program that we need. I'm going to skip. Uh, there are uh, some other measures that could be available and that Biden may try to take advantage of, but I'm going to skip sort of to the closing uh, point here. I've talked about national um, legislation primarily, but there is also work going on at the states. California has a very uh, ambitious climate change program, a cap and trade program, AB 32 which is producing significant reductions and may serve as a model for future programs if, if the nation decides that it wants to uh, uh, adopt them. Localities, many of you live in places, cities where the city has undertaken to mitigate climate change. The city has, has the ability through um, through transportation infrastructure, through changes in urban form to affect the level of emissions that uh, occur as a result of, of urbanized living. The cities also, localities also, are in a, in a position to address the need to adapt to climate change that's already occurring. I've talked about climate change as a global problem. It is a global problem in its genesis. That is, the emissions that contribute to climate change have to be considered at a global level. But the effects of climate change are different from place to place. And therefore, responding to those effects and trying to avoid those, respect, those effects is more a function of the locality, the place, which is actually seeing these effects. So you get at the local level attention to mitigation, but also to adaptation. Do we build a flood wall? Do we change the highway? Do we build protective structures around our subway so it doesn't get flooded at high tide? And so on and so forth. And, I've, and in the, in the, uh, in the um, questions I've suggested, we think about uh, the, the, the local aspects of this problem, as well as the global aspects. So we have some legal structures in place at the international level, not clear how well they're gonna work, but we have some hopes. At the domestic level, I think we don't have the, all the tools that we need. We have some tools that can be used. Uh, hopefully those can be marshaled in an effective way and ultimately we'll have some comprehensive legislation and then we have these encouraging um, developments, at least in some states and, um, and localities. So the law hasn't quite caught up with climate change yet, but uh, maybe it will soon. So thanks, John. that's it. <laughs> thanks, John. You can stop the screen sharing. Okay. And So how did I do, Kate, on time? <laughs> Was I, is that right? You did, you did very well. Perfect. Perfect. You did very well. Okay. Um, I might say how impressed I am, but I also can say how depressed I am, John. I was that you know that was my goal. <laughs> I mean, look, guys, this is not a happy story. I can't make it a happy story. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go to breakouts um, and uh, two things. Uh, if you find yourself in a breakout room alone, 
or would like to come back to the main room, simply look for the leave breakout room button at the bottom and you can come back to the main room and Kate can reassign you. Or if you're alone, she can put you in another room. John Cannon and I will be moderators in breakout rooms in addition to John Vipon, John Huffnagel, Ellen Stern, Harry Tether and Ken Wilcox. If one of these folks is not in your room, you can either have chaos or appoint someone to host or moderate. It's up to you. Or just chat among yourselves. And John has given me three questions to that you might consider in your talk among yourselves. Um, one is local, as John said. What is happening surrounding climate change in your state and your community? And how would you rate its likely effectiveness? This is quite interesting, I think, for us. The next is the national question. Will the US be able to establish an effective, stable climate change policy in the current political climate? What might give some hope for that? So the one is the national one is effective on the national scale and what's your hopes? And finally, the international one, he poses a quick question to us. What is your level of confidence that the parties to the Paris Agreement will increase their ambition to meet the two degree goal. How might that happen? So you, any one of you, if you're interested, you can pick anyone, local, national, or international, or you can talk about all three, whatever interests you. And then we'll come back in about 15 to 16 minutes and we'll open it up for questions that are either is in your group or you might have individually. So Kate, are you ready to break us into breakout rooms? I'm ready and I'm gonna send you all momentarily. Group and I hope you all did. Um, now, if you don't know how to raise a Zoom hand, uh, Kate and I will try to call on you as you do it. And hopefully Kate will see, or I'll see if I, I'm blocked out of my space here now. I'm going to try to see. Hey, it looks like we there already we have a couple hands. I got it. Um, in under the participants, I think your hand will go up in order. So we have a question from Van Hahn. Van, if you unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, I, it's not a question. I want to congratulate John on his work and say I'm proud to be an alumnus of the University of Virginia Law School. And I'm proud All right. to be on board. <laughs> Thank you, Van. I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, yeah, hey. I'm not an alumnus of UVA, but I'm proud to be to be here. It's a great institution. Uh, Paul Lipoff, you're next. If you unmute, go ahead. Okay. John, I have a couple of factual questions or scientific questions. Sure. Uh, <laughs> where are we? Do. Where are we now in term relative to the plus two degrees centigrade above uh, pre-industrial levels? Well, we're we're uh, 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 we're about one degree centigrade above. Okay. So uh, we have we have some space, but the projections that I showed you suggest that if we continue as we do, business as usual by 2100, will be will have broken the bank on two degrees. Right. Right. Now, the way the way the science works, suppose we froze our greenhouse gas emissions at current levels, you know, just by magic or by yeah, whatever. Right. And, and they, they, uh, we continued creating greenhouse gases at the current rate, but not, no greater. Would the temperature remain stable? No. See, that's the, that's the really crucial challenge here. We can't just level off because right now at the current levels, we're adding to the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And as we continue to add, the warming, uh, the warming pressure increases. 
So if we, if we leveled off, we might be better off than if we continued to increase emissions, but we wouldn't have stabilized the climate. We wouldn't have created conditions under which the climate can be stable. To do that, we need to achieve no net emissions. That is no additional emissions attributable to human activity that aren't netted out by a sink like the ocean or the, or the, or the forest. I'm going to call on Rich okay, Gehrman great. next, and then and then Ted McPherson had a question he sent in before we began. So I'm going to Rich, and then we'll go to you, Ted, next. Go ahead, Rich. Yeah, I'm wondering if there are any uh, potential technological solutions in the pipeline. You know, if not a silver bullet, something that can at least help with the emissions. Uh, someone mentioned burning methane, or uh, you know, I'm not sure something that goes in the atmosphere and eats up carbon. <laughs> Uh, right. or something like that. So, so, there, so there are, I mean, there are various technologies that are being looked at, um, including um, geoengineering options. So, you know, one idea is to put reflective shields in the atmosphere to increase the albedo and reflect more of the light of the sun back to space. Um, there are other proposals to uh, fertilize the ocean to increase the growth of, of algae, which absorbs carbon dioxide. And if you can find some way to sequester that um, carbon dioxide at the bottom of the ocean or somewhere, that could be uh, that could increase the sink, the sink effect, taking uh, carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, the, the, the challenge with, with, uh, with a number of these technologies is that they can be implemented by a single actor, like a single country could put up reflective shields that would have a global impact. And that might, and, and that, and that might be done you know, inadvisably in a way that has an impact that we don't like. So the political problem of, of regulating those technologies is pretty daunting and has, has made people say, well, that, if we have to, we'll get there, but let's try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through these more uh, conventional means um, first. Ted McPherson. Hey, John, thanks very much for your good work in this important area. Um, well, since as you point out, it's difficult to legislate, negotiate, or promise behavior, yeah. how does one practically create a continuity of purpose for achieving valuable results in global climate change? As illustrated by our space program and the NASA continuity yeah. of purpose over 10 years to go to the moon, how do you get a continuity of purpose in this global issue to produce real results? Yeah. So that's so that's really putting your finger on the crux of it, and I don't I don't have a good answer. I mean, I think the the comparison to the NASA program is interesting uh, because we have had a, a program that is sustainable over time and been highly successful. Um, but my, my 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 perception would be that the NASA program is much less divisive politically and therefore much less likely to be subject to the kind of political vacillation that we've seen in the climate change arena. And then you have to, uh, and then you have to produce that continuity, not just at the national level, but at the international level. Uh, I think it can be done, but it, it's gonna take a while to do it. And what's gonna have to happen is the development of, of trust and reciprocal behavior on the part of major emitters at the global level. And uh, I can't predict whether that will happen. Uh, I'm hopeful that it will, but I think that's a, a bet that the Paris Agreement is making that's not, uh, that's, that's still uh, uncertain. I think you're right because the peaceful coexistence with some of those rivals and large emitters in our lifetime, remaining lifetime, right. is a huge challenge. And without that trust that you refer to, it's simply going to default to a competition yeah. where everyone's self-interest right. will be pre preeminent. 
right? And then, got, the, and then the free rider problem just destroys whatever uh, whatever collective uh, approach that you that you can take. We've got four hands up. Brian, you're next. Try to keep it crisp so we can get to the other three. Uh, yeah, my uh, question has to do with the um, international scene. If I were in India or China, I'd be saying our per capita yeah. emissions are way, way lower than the US. What are you beating on us for? How much does this enter into the, the perspective, enter into the international negotiations? It, it, it defines the international negotiations or it has up to this point. Uh, so, so the argument of the developing countries like India is, first of all, we're not as advanced economically. Our per capita income is lower. And the reason we have a climate change problem today is because you wealthy countries have used fossil fuels to develop your economies and be wealthy. We should have the same chance in order to make things equal. Uh, so you guys go ahead and reduce your emissions and we'll catch up with you at some point. And when we do, then we'll talk about reducing our emissions. That's it. I mean, that's a caricature, but that's basically, that has been historically uh, the position. Now, what the Paris Agreement did was at least eliminate um, the, the hard line between developing and developed countries. But that, but that mindset is going to affect, it has to affect what the developing countries choose to submit in their, in their nationally determined contributions. Um, Andy Parnes, you're up next. Uh, let me ask you a legal question. Are there any cases percolating around in the courts that would challenge the EPA's authority on the one hand to do federal regulations? And are there cases on the other hand where you have states like California that are uh, advancing uh, in the, you know, are, are more advanced in the federal policies yeah. and keeping them from doing that. Are there any cases out there that are you're worried about? Well, yeah. So, so all of the regulations that get adopted under the Clean Air Act addressing greenhouse gases are litigated. And they're litigated as, you know, under the standard administrative law principles of courts look at them to see whether the agency has acted within its legal authority and to see whether the agency has acted in a, in a reasonable way based on the record before it. Um, so, so that kind of review will continue um, whether the, the administration is pro-climate or anti-climate. A lot of Trump's rules uh, uh, have not survived judicial review. I think their success rate is about 20%, which is unusually low for an administration. Uh, so that litigation continues. Um, California has its own legal regime, which is much more uh, assertive than the federal regime with the cap and trade system. And that has survived judicial review in that state. Uh, and is, is just a very robust example of what's possible if you have the political will to, to accomplish. There have been some other cases based on common law theories, uh, you know, public nuisance and so forth, cases against oil companies trying to obtain damages for climate change. And those common law cases have not fared well in the courts. The courts just don't want to put themselves in a position of, of determining what they think is national policy on a major issue through judicial fiat. They're just, they're just not going to go there. Okay. With respect to your time, we're going to take two more questions that our hands have been up. Uh, we have Ken Wilcox and then Greg Meister is going to end. But I will tell you that after we're through, for those of you that have to leave, we say goodbye and I'll tell you what's coming up next. Uh, but those that want to stay, the college is nice enough to say they'll keep this open for just general conversation for 15 minutes afterwards. So Ken, your question. Okay, great, thank you. And thank you, John, for doing this, uh, going to the effort to put this together for us because it was uh, uh, really enlightening and also great to see you and everybody else. So yeah. thanks to everybody for joining in too. Um, my, my problem with this is it seems, and I think the challenge is to me, it seems there's an imbalance between 
the benefit and the cost. Yeah. The cost is very real and right in front of us, uh, either in, in uh, expense or dislocation or whatever. And the benefits are kind of uh, out there. Right. So right. How, do we, how do we bring that together? And as Rick Ackley said, maybe things have to get worse before they can get better, you know? Well, I think, I, I mean, that, that may be the case. I think you're exactly right. The costs seem very, because the costs are dispersed globally, we don't see them. We see, we see the effects of climate change, but we, but, you know, psychologically, we're not connecting that with what we do, the choices we make. Because the choices we make individually have no effect, virtually, because the effects are globalized. So it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm, if I get a, a, an electric vehicle, the, the climate of the world is not gonna respond to that one iota, not, not, not measurable, not even close to measurable. John, in our group, Al Gortz, who lives down there on the coast of Florida said, you know when they're gonna come to realization? Yeah. When their homes go into the ocean, yeah. then they might do something. Yeah. Greg, you're next, you're up. Thank you, John, for this very compelling uh, presentation. I really appreciate it. You said at the very outset that we need to have a common understanding of the science. And I'm sure you meant that as a nation, we need to have that. Right. In fact, we don't have that. Right. Um, and we have, not to put too fine a point on it, we have one party, the Republican Party, that doesn't accept the science pretty much at all, or they have an alternative view of that science. And some of them can make a very compelling case, I think, that their science is different or better or whatever. So given all that, uh, what will it really take other than massive floods uh, in, in this very partisan age, what do you think it might take to really move the needle? Um, uh, so that's a good question. And, you know, my view about the science is that the science is pretty clear, but. But when people talk about climate science in a political setting, they're not talking about the science at all. They're talking about whether you, you have a conservative viewpoint or a liberal viewpoint, because the, those viewpoints are so deeply enmeshed in a position that isn't based on any, I mean, I don't, I haven't done an independent review of all the scientific studies. I get my science from synthetic reports that are done by expert panels and so forth. So uh, I, I, think, I think the science dispute is a symptom, not a cause of the polarization of political polarization. And if you could find some way to, to begin to create some uh, new connections politically, I would think, I think you're gonna see that kind of resistance is all, but I have no, I have no, I have no secret for, for resolving the political polarization. I think that's a deeper structural problem right now. Okay, I wanna respect your time, everyone. Um, on May 20th, Rich Gehrman will speak about his experience creating the nonprofit Safe Passage for Children in Minnesota. Safe Passage uh, advocates for child protection and foster care programs in Minnesota. And thanks to Rich and his work, it's become a model for child wel welfare in the nonprofit world. Ken Wilcox, uh, who was mayor there in Minnesota, will be your moderator. And uh, now the college will keep this session open for those who want to stay. I'll, I'll try to, if you, if you want to raise your hand again and make a comment or talk to somebody, I'll try to be the moderator if enough stay. And to those leaving uh, on behalf of your class officers, I can't thank you enough. Uh, John, I can't thank you and Kate, you and the college deserve our undying thanks for all your work on our behalf. So thank you. Good well, night to those that have to go and those that are staying, let's see. Great to join you all. Really enjoyed it. I was, I was just.